So let's take a look at how we would set up the spring pendulum in a Lagrangian problem. The diagram is very similar to what we had before. We have our mass here hanging from now not a rod but a spring. We're still going to measure the angle here that the spring makes with the vertical axis. So all the geometry there is still the same. The main difference is that now it's this L here that is allowed to stretch out and compress. So when we have these uh, Cartesian coordinates x and y, this theta is allowed to change as it swings back and forth, but now this L is allowed to change as it goes in and out. So previously these L's were a constant, but the equations are still the same. The transformation from x and y Cartesian coordinates to our generalized coordinates is still the same as it was before. But now, because the L's are uh, functions of time just like the thetas, now when we go to take our time derivatives to get the velocities x dot and y dot, we need to apply the product rule because I have L as a function of time, time sine of theta as a function of time. So I have to do the good old product rule. Take the derivative of the first thing, leave the second thing alone, plus leave the first thing alone, take the derivative of the second thing. And then I have the chain rule again, where I'm going to take the derivative of sine, turn it into cosine, and then multiply by theta dot to represent the internal derivative. Uh, the derivative y dot velocity in the y direction goes very similar. Uh, you just end up with the different combinations of positive, negatives, cosines, and sines, right? That happens every time you take derivatives involving trig's functions, there's going to be a different combination of the functions and the, and the signs, S-I-G-N. So we can start constructing our energy functionals here. We've got our kinetic energy, good old one half mv squared. You can always start with this as one half m x dot squared plus y dot squared. That is always true. It's just not always useful. So now we're gonna take our expression for x dot and our expression for y dot, plug those in here. We're just gonna square each of them. Again, it's a little more complicated because of the product rule since you have L as a function of time and theta as a function of time. That's gonna be a theme throughout this entire derivation that now instead of just having one thing squared, I have one thing plus another squared and then another cluster of things, one thing plus another squared here. But we have something nice coming up, right? Anytime you have sines and cosines being squared, added together, etc., you can usually expect some things to combine and cancel. And that's exactly what happens here. So when you carry out these square, when you square these expressions, you do your FOIL method. You have your first term, your outside inside term, and your last term. Remember, when you're squaring a, a, a two-term polynomial like this, um, you are going to get a two in the middle times the same thing, right? Your outside and your inside terms are going to give you the same expression, so you'll get plus two times that, right? Uh, then we do the same thing for this other one, but you notice what happens here. I get the exact same middle expression, so the outside times the inside, even though each piece is different, they all have the same individual factors collectively, and so I get the same thing here. But because of the negative sign, the one lone negative sign I have in all these combinations, these two nasty things end up canceling with each other. So remember, in these Lagrangian problems, the math is always going to get uglier before it gets easier. So you have all this long stuff to write out to keep track of, and then you can cancel them out. Very nice. Uh, the other thing that happens, you take a look at these green underlines. I have an L dot squared, an L dot squared. I have a sine squared theta and a cosine squared theta. Again, when sines and cosines are getting squared, you can expect to use this version of the Pythagorean theorem that sine squared plus cosine squared of the same angle equals one. So you'll have this thing plus this thing will give you one. Same thing over here, this thing plus this thing will give you one. And so the only thing you're left with over here in the kinetic energy, very nice, is one half m and two terms, right? And it looks like it makes sense, right? There's a term that represents changes in the length and a term that represents changes in the angle right? So even though this kinetic energy is not a vector and it's mixing together the different dimensions that we're moving around, it still tends to isolate movement in different directions. That doesn't always happen. Uh, when we get to the double pendulum in a future series, uh, we'll see that they all kind of uh, cluster together. But at least in this one, you have uh, motion along the radial direction and motion along the angular direction separately in your kinetic energy. 
For the potential energy, the main difference now is we have two potential energies. We have gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is the same. It's still mgy. Y is still negative L cosine theta. So this piece is the exact same like we had before when we were dealing with the pendulum. But now we have to add the potential energy that gets stored in the spring. So the potential energy for a spring, 1 half K delta L squared. This delta L, this is uh, the value of L, the length of the spring, compared with its rest length, compared with its equilibrium kind of natural length that it literally likes to hang at. Um, and so we're going to represent this delta L as L minus L0. So L0 here is the equilibrium kind of rest length of the spring. Uh, that is a constant that we will get to put into our simulation. So this is going to be 1 half K and then this difference squared. So putting all of that together, we've got the Lagrangian is kinetic energy minus potential energy. You can always use that. So we take these two pieces from the kinetic energy and these two pieces from the potential energy. You notice we're going to flip the signs on them, so this will become positive, this will become negative. And there it is. There's your Lagrangian. The actual physics setup is done now, and we can move on to Lagrange's equation. So remember, Lagrange's equation, this, uh, this business with these partial derivatives with respect to q dot and with respect to q, they work for any number of generalized coordinates. And so however many generalized coordinates you have, you have that many copies of Lagrange's equation for that particular generalized coordinate. For the pendulum, we had one generalized coordinate, q equals theta. And so we had one Lagrange's equation. For the spring pendulum, we have two generalized coordinates. We have the theta like we had before, and now we have L. This is the new piece. And so now we are going to have two sets of Lagrange's equation. We're going to have a Lagrange equation for L and a Lagrange equation for theta. You just take them one at a time. The order generally doesn't matter. I like to save the angles for last because it involves a lot more trig functions than the L will. So let's start with Q equals L. So first you just start with Q equals L. We take our left hand side, partial of L with respect to L dot, uh, partial of Lagrangian with respect to length dot, and take your right-hand side, partial of Lagrangian with respect to L. Remember, you take your generalized coordinate L and its velocity L dot, and you treat those as independent variables. Yes, they are both functions of time, but the way a functional works is that you're passing this function and its derivative, and for the sake of the derivatives, you are treating them as if they are independent variables. All right, so when you take the uh, partial of our Lagrangian with respect to L dot, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, only this term has an L dot. No one else has an L dot, so all the other terms go away. So you do your power rule here. And then we have one more step. We have to take a derivative. This one becomes ML double dot. Nice and simple. For the right-hand side, you're taking the derivative with respect to L and leaving everything else fixed. You might notice that L shows up in a few places. It showed up in the second term, the third term, and the fourth term. So we're going to have three terms for partial L with respect to uh, little l. So we'll have this 2ml theta dot squared, mg cosine theta minus kL minus L naught. So remember the goal is to take this left hand side, set it equal to the right hand side, and then solve for the one and only double dotted thing that you get. So even though we have these two coupled Lagrange's equations and they both involve both of these variables, you're generally only ever going to have one double dotted thing in each of your Lagrange's equation. There might be a scenario where you end up with two and you have to separate them, but usually what will happen is this equation will have an L double dot. The other one's going to have a theta double dot. And so we already have the two second derivatives separated. Uh, let's take a look what happens here. The only thing we need to do to simplify this is divide by M. Uh, a couple of folks have M's up here. So we really only end up with the M in the spring force. And what I hope you'll notice is that these two pieces look very familiar. You have G cosine theta. That is the acceleration when you are dealing with gravity, right? That you are going to have, yes, right? That you're going to have gravity modified by the angle that you are currently swinging at. Uh, and so this is the piece that represents the gravitational force. This is the piece that represents the spring force, right? This looks like gravitational force on a ramp. And this one looks like a spring force. That's because whenever you take these derivatives of a potential energy, you are going to get a force. The piece that 
I didn't predict, that I can't predict using forces, is this 2L theta dot squared. And this thing is related to conservation of angular momentum, that it's as if you have this effective force that increases with how fast you are spinning around. And you might recognize that as a centripetal acceleration. So I've got my centripetal acceleration that just kind of appears. I have my acceleration due to gravity, and I have my spring force here. So that's it. That's it for uh, for L. We end up with L double dot equals this. This is a thing I can go ahead and plug into the code. But I also need theta double dot, right? Because this L double dot is what I use to update L dot and then update L. But I also have in here a theta dot. Right, So this is what we call theta and L are coupled, meaning as one changes, it changes the other, changes the first one, changes the second one, etc. So let's take a look at the Q equals theta case. Uh, let's see, here's the Lagrangian again, uh, just for uh, remembrance sake. So we're going to take the left-hand side, taking a derivative with respect to theta dot. There is only one term with a theta dot, and so we will end up with this piece here. Again, we have to take a derivative with respect to time. Uh, it's the derivative with respect to time attaches to the partial of Lagrangian with respect to the Q dot. So all the times go together on the left hand side. Um, you have to watch out here with this term because you've got, uh, again, you've got a product rule, right? You have this as a function of time and this is a function of time. So first we'll take a derivative of the L squared. That will get us a chain rule over here. And then we have the second derivative with respect to time of theta. Again, you only end up with one double dot here, right? You end up with a theta double dot. There are no L double dots to be seen in this entire equation. So this is kind of like what we had before, and then you have this extra piece. Again, this goes along with um, conservation of angular momentum. Uh, this is the term that's going to help us uh, make sure we get that piece in. Then you look at the right-hand side, take a partial of L with respect to theta. Well, theta itself only shows up in one term. There's a theta dot over here, but again, theta dot and theta, treat them as independent variables for the sake of the derivative. So three of the terms will go away, right? That's why I love derivatives, because so many things just go away. Uh, and we're left with this piece here that represents uh, your sort of angular acceleration, as it were. And so we take our left-hand side, uh, set it equal to our right-hand side. There is a lot that can cancel here, right? Everybody has a mass, so mass just goes away. Theta double dot does not care about mass one whit. Uh, we're also going to divide everybody by L squared. Not everybody has an L squared, but everybody has at least an L. And the theta double dot has an L squared attached to it, so we want to get theta double dot by itself. So some of these Ls will cancel out, so like I have an L over L squared and an L over L squared. And so what we'll have is a theta double dot, uh, this uh, funky term over here. I really like the symmetry of this piece here, this L dot over L. So it's the velocity of the rate of change of the length of the spring in units of the length of the spring. So think of it like the percent change of the length of the spring. It's such a cool little uh, 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 combination of variables that just kind of falls into place here in the derivation. I really like it. Again, this should look familiar because this is the piece that we had in the pendulum solution, right? So we, we had this. We had this exact piece right here. Uh, if, if you think about it from our previous problem with the pendulum, we had an L dot equal to zero. We had L fixed. So this term was not here, and we just said theta double dot equals negative g over L sine theta. So you can actually take this problem and revert it back to the pendulum if you just take L as a constant instead of a function of time. And so you'll get uh, this equation here. You solve for theta double dot. Uh, you'll end up with your conservation of angular momentum term, and you'll end up with your traditional uh, pendulum term. So those are the two equations of motion for the spring pendulum. Again, it has two generalized coordinates leading us to two equations with two second derivatives with respect to time. Next video, we will take these and start working with them in a computational model.